We're winning the war on drugs. We're succeeding. It's working. We're locking these people up. This is crazy. This is a fraud. This is a lie. My role in writing the mandatory minimums was the worst thing that I've ever done. Um, I have met the children and the mothers of people in prison for unjustly long sentences because of these laws. And they are just, you know, the dozens of thousands, of tens of thousands of people who are in federal prison for way too long. So, you know, when, I mean, you know, there, there, there are some, there's a woman who, who, who calls me from prison. She has a son who was nine years old when she went to prison. The son attempted to commit suicide. Uh, the son has run away. The son... The son, the son misses his mother. Now you, you think about the families that are screwed up. But, you know, the, 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 kid, the kid that doesn't know anything about this, the kid, you know, the, the, kid didn't, the, kid, the kid is being hurt. The, the mother had a boyfriend who was a dope dealer. And the, the dope dealers said that the mother stored the drugs. She said, I didn't store drugs in my house. If there were drugs in my house, it was the boyfriend. I had nothing to do with it. I don't, I mean, it's a woman who has no money. Her car is repossessed. She's not a dope dealer. You know, she's struggling to take care of her kids. She lives in public housing. She doesn't, I mean, she has nothing. She's not a dope dealer. She's doing 235 months. She's doing almost 20 years. This is the law, the 1986 law. Almost all of this came out of our subcommittee. But the top item here of penalties and enforcement, the Narcotics Penalties and Enforcement Act, that's the mandatory minimums. Even though it's first, it was considered last. It was considered in the last three days. It was considered without any hearings. We had no expert advice from the Justice Department, from the Bureau of Prisons, from the judiciary, from professors, from people with experience in other states, from bar associations, from nobody. There were no hearings. The thing is really being kind of stitched together, numbers plucked out of the air to, and this has had more impact on federal prison population, federal drug spending than anything. This hasty, off-the-cuff thing. This is like snake oil. The war on drugs is like snake oil. Snake oil is an American expression for a, uh, uh, a nostrum, a, a medication that doesn't work. The war, the war on drugs is a very powerful industry. The drug testing industry is probably a billion dollar a year industry. The, we have spent just in building new prisons, $30 billion in the last 10 years. $30 billion in not new schools, not new hospitals, but in cells and bars and, you know, stainless steel trays and stainless steel toilets and cameras and electronic gates. I mean, this enormously expensive All stuff. over the world, the United States is pressuring governments around drug policy in Europe, in Australia, in the Western Hemisphere, in Asia. I, tr I was a part of that. I traveled to Mexico, Peru, Colombia, Jamaica, Bolivia, with the U.S. Congress. To, we met with uh, the president of Peru, with the uh, prime minister of Jamaica, uh, with you know, top government officials to pressure them to do more of what we wanted in drug policy. A drug policy which is a failed and flawed and corrupt policy. In Australia, for example, recently 
they have been trying to to set up um, a, a like the like the Swiss trial, a a approach with for heroin addicts to make clean heroin available to addicts to eliminate the criminality and stop the spread of disease. And the Assistant Secretary of State goes down there and threatens the government of Australia and says, look, you cannot do this. You know, this is going to have enormous implications. You know, um, we are, you know, we will take actions that you will not like, and it may be in trade and it may be in other foreign policy matters, but this is, this is unacceptable. It does feel like Soviet Russia. It does. We tap telephones, and the government wants more power to tap telephones. We have a we have an army of informants providing information to the government. There are, by my estimation, perhaps one hundred thousand informants in the United States providing information to. There are fifty federal agencies gathering information. Every state police agency. Thousands of county sheriffs and municipal police departments all have narcotics departments. They, if you are a cop working on narcotics, if you don't have informants, you're nobody. You're nowhere. So there is constantly, there is an enormous surveillance apparatus going on in our society around drugs. We, we monitor people by giving them urine tests. We, have, we ask children to inform on their parents. Is that so? There, the, there is a, the largest drug abuse prevention program in America is called DARE, D-A-R-E. It's called, it stands for Drug Abuse Resistance Education. It's run by the police. The police go into the schools, and the police bring what they call a DARE box, in which students are encouraged to put into the box information that they know about drug use. Uh, police officers will bring and burn material that smells like marijuana and say, if you've ever smelled this in your home, write it down and put it in the dare box. And so parents are being arrested on the, infor on the, on the, on the, on the infor information provided by their children. It happens. You mean. It does happen. It just, it just happened here in Washington. A top official in the U.S. Department of Energy and his wife, a lawyer, were arrested three or four weeks ago because their 16-year-old daughter went to the police. This kind of thing is happening. What happens to the child? The child gets taken away and put in, in a government protection. The man loses his job and the people are facing jail. This is a marijuana case.